Welcome to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The key to getting the most out of the seminar series is to listen to the small things, the subtle adjustments our faculty teams adhere to when the fishing might be tough or they're trying to target trophy game fish. That's what we call the gold nuggets of the seminar series. So come with me, let's get right to it and join, in progress, the Saltwater Sports and the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. A very intriguing session dealing with Wahoo and a very distinguished panel. Captain Alan Wenzel, an expert at catching them out of South Florida, the Florida Keys and the Bahamas. Uh, Harry Vernon III, notorious uh, for his exploits, fishing exploits that is, and then some out of the South Florida area, the Keys and also the Bahamas. And I like to call him the pride of Marathon in the Florida Keys. Very few anglers know those waters and those fisheries better than the one, the only, Captain Jimmy Gagliardini. So there's your big introduction, guys. Now let's get down to brass tacks and start talking about Wahoo. Very intriguing fish it's, it, that people want to know more on how do you catch Wahoo. But first, we need to understand a little bit about the habits with Wahoo themselves. One of the big misconceptions is that Wahoo is a true blue offshore fish. But they're pretty much an overstated king mackerel in that they favor structure a lot and they favor a lot of the near shore type waters in wrecks. Now, Jimmy, I'm gonna to talk to you. You have a vast amount of experience fishing, the reefs of the Florida Keys, the wrecks and such. And what do you find Wahoo as far as you had a bullet down to a depth window where you would find the heaviest concentrations? What would that be? I would say 120 to 200 feet of water. That's where I, uh, that's where I tend to target them the most. Gotcha. And the other thing that really drives them too is understanding where, like a lot of the fisheries, where the currents, the Gulf Stream current might intersect. Uh, some good bottom might intersect the wreck. That's where the Rothschild's fishing forecast analyses come in, where you could look at the temperature breaks around certain structures. And then Sirius XM's fish mapping now shows you surface temperature fronts and sur surface temperature contours, the fronts being the strongest concentrations of a water surface temperature break, and the contours showing some of these breaks along certain depth contours. And when you could find that over some of these inshore structures, where there's a change of currents, whether that would be a uh, color change, that really targets uh, a lot of the Wahoo into getting zoned up there. Alan, as far as other tips in, in trying to find Wahoo, what would they be? Well, one, we target really, George, um, certain times of the month and certain times of the year. So full moon, two or three days before, two or three days after, that's really our key if we actually want to target Wahoo, that's what we go after. Uh, the other thing is the, just overall wind patterns, right? If it's blowing, you know, 15, 20, we really try not to target them because they do, they end up going deeper. Uh, so we like it to be, you know, 10 knot winds. So two foot seas is really good. Uh, and then it's, you know, we catch them on structure, a lot on the wrecks in the, in the Florida Keys. In the Bahamas, we actually just circle in and out of the, the shallows. We'll actually go from 50 feet out to um, you know 150 feet and then back in again it's the tides it's all about the tides all right playing it on the you know, tides, no playing, doubt. you know you want to get an outgoing tide to, so all the nutrients are coming in on the keys on in the bahama side on the other way it's the incoming tide in the on the florida key side and harry give us some uh intel here on on, on locating water well to me off of miami structure is huge I'll sit there. If I'm going to go, number one, I'm going to go early, early morning. If I'm strictly uh, targeting Wahoo, I go super early in the morning or late, late in the afternoon. It seems to be the best bite on your full moon. Again, three days before or after obviously is better, but we've got them real good on the full moon. And uh, if, if you look at a chart a lot of times, and you'll see areas, uh, like when we're in the Bahamas, areas of peaks that come out, and you'll see the, the upwellings from current and water. And we'll hit those areas and work those peaks. So it'll come up to 80 feet of water, out to 300, and, and we'll work that area and had great success doing that. Yeah, no doubt about it, too. And, and Jimmy, talk to me about the wrecks. Where does this all play in Oahu? There's one or two areas on the reef that have 
targeted some wahoos, but the majority of it is uh, is on the on the wrecks, without a doubt. Any kind of structure, a vertical structure, anything that comes comes up off the bottom, uh, you know, in 20, 30 feet uh, from the bottom. And I, there's a couple areas on the reef where there's a big drop off, holds a lot of bait, and I've caught some wahoo around those areas. But without a doubt, the majority of them are on the wrecks. Early in the morning, you know, the first three hours of the day. Uh, is when I target them. And what have you found maybe condition-wise, be it uh, current movement, be it uh, an edge coming in, is, is what other factors really stimulate that wahoo bite around the wrecks? East current, clean water. You get up on the edge and when that water is nice and clean, blue water, pushing east, th that's when we seem to do the best. And not a ripping current, you know what I mean? Just a mild east current, uh, that's when we get a lot of them. Right. Now, Alan, I always remember this and talking to your son, Ryan, who runs a charter boat out of Isla Mirada. And I always give him a hard time because he also dives and he spear fishes, which I always say that's cheating. But, you know, that's we'll pick that up at a later case. Yeah. But he told me some interesting things about Wahoo. When he's been down there, he'll see around the wreck a giant school of Wahoo. And they make large circles. Yeah. And then eventually, here they come again. So at times, they may not be feeding. But they're staying, they're staying around the wreck and just making very large circles around it. Exactly, especially if there's areas that have multiple wrecks. Like in the Keys, you know, we have the Duane, the Bib, or whatever. So they'll go from wreck to wreck. So they'll make this huge circle. And one of the things that most fishermen end up trying to do, they'll stay around one and they'll just, you know, circle for an hour or two, whatever they try to do. Um, and it's very difficult because they won't really catch them because in reality, they're going up, up not only are they doing from wreck to wreck, but they're going along the reef edge, right? Right, not circling around just around the wreck. They're going, you know, north and south in this case. Very good. And what we're going to do when we come back, we talked about some of the conditions, but we're all primarily small boat anglers. So I want to talk about some of the go-to tactics of catching wahoo, and there are a ton of tactics, you know, from high speed troll and all, but I want to focus more on these center consoles, smaller boats, how you can catch wahoo effectively, around 10 knots and even less. And we're gonna jump right in that when we get back from this commercial break. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. We'll be right back. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. And let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers, and high-performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The topic is Wahoo. We discussed some of the conditions that would increase our odds of catching wahoo. But now let's focus on some of the go-to ways of catching them at speeds 10 miles an hour pretty much and then down. And one of the most effective ways, and I'll take the liberty of start this off, is you could sit and catch wahoo on the troll six, seven, eight miles an hour, the very simple setup. You could have a lure in front of a ballyhoo. It could be a Williamson lure, Islander, doesn't make any kind of a difference, but have that rig to single strand wire number six and number seven. When Wahoo tend to strike quite a bit and, and cut the bait, hit behind uh, the gill plates and such, you'll make your standard pin rig. And the difference being is that when you make your haywire wraps, instead of doing two or three or four and then commencing it with a barrel wrap and a pin rig, continue making the haywire twists and get yourself another inch, two inches, and you could come three inches all the way down and then finish up with a pin rig. So when you hook your ballyhoo and you rig this together, that hook will be more around the midsection, which could thwart some of those short strikers. And you put some of these, three or four of them, a couple off the flats, a couple off the riggers, and troll, you'll catch quite a few wahoo around that. The other thing that we do, George, on those same kind of rig is we put a little egg sinker right under there. Sometimes use a little bit bigger hook yep. when it goes in. And then again, you can put the ballyhoo with your cone. But again, I'll, we use a little th thicker wire. Yep. And, and we say thicker, what what number? This is number 10. Oh, I see you were stepping up. Okay. Yeah, because this one is a little bit more for when we go to the Bahamas. Right. Um, so you're using that. And then again, using a short strand with uh, an Albright knot to, um, you know, back to 120 pound mono. Yep. on that end. 
and I gotta give Jimmy Gagliardini this credit. Uh, one of the most intriguing Wahoo trolling rigs that I've ever seen. And you're a kind of guy that really gets upset if you don't catch those fish. And we did an article in Saltwater Sportsman on this, and I affectionately dubbed this rig the Gagliardini Grabber. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, Jim, explain this unique rig. Well, I use just a standard ballyhoo rig, a pin rig. Uh, but, you know, again, you get those those bites where they're, they're cutting the ballyhoo in half, and you know, I had it happen numerous times, and I said, all right, I'm going to solve this problem. So what I did is on the eye of the hook, I just added two more wire leaders with smaller hooks. They're, they're four O's, uh, but they're quadruple strength hooks. And I'm pulling this on 30 pound test. I try to downsize on the tackle and make it a little bit more sporty. And, uh, and I just, I don't hook the other two hooks into the fish. I just let them ride alongside the belly as it's swimming along and it'll swim perfectly. But these two hooks, when he comes up and tries to cut, cut that belly behind the hook, he's gonna get one of those, one or both of those hooks. And as the more he thrashes around, he's just gonna get him caught on his face over here. <laughs> now you might pull the hook on him, but I can assure you he will go away with a sore mouth. Well, that's what's good about using a lighter tackle. You're not, you know, using 80 where it just rips the hook out. So yeah, and I, you know, you hook a big fish, starts ripping line off, I back the drag off just to eliminate any mysterious break offs. And uh, it's amazing how big a, big a fish you can catch on a rig like this. Where do you position them and what's the trick of making that work? I'll put them on the riggers or the flat lines. You know, okay. a lot of times I'll just pull three, I'll put one on each rigger and one on a flat line, clip down and fish them a pretty good ways back. I mean, I'm fishing them, you know, 250, 300 feet back. Gotcha. Harry Vernon, you're, you're sitting there with a planer. You're, you're going like old school. This you're like is, well, dig, digging up the dead and bringing them back to life well, with these let things, Let me tell you what, you? though. I might be doing that, but this, <laughs> it's the reason I'm bringing this up, there's, I don't think there's a charter boat out there that doesn't have a planer on, on their boat. And uh, I've sold millions of these things. And this particular rig is a real simple, simple planer. Number eight planer. You snap your rod to this, which is normally... Uh, I'd like using like a 50 or an 80 pound braid because it cuts the water really, really well. And then we'll use a ball bearing snap swivel off the back of the planer. So, because obviously I'm using a spoon, a three and a half drone spoon. Uh, we used to use all wire leaders forever, for, you know, 60 feet, but now we're going 60 feet mono. We use 80 to 100 pound mono. So this is just a short version. And then we go to a three and a half drone. They make them in various colors and everything works really, really well. And what happens is when you put this down, uh, what's great about this, it's working the deeper water columns. And it's a right behind the boat style deal, and it'll go down 40 feet, and you control pretty much any speed with a number eight planer. And with that spoon going off the back of there, and they hit that spoon, what happens? It triggers this off, and it straightens out. So you have a fight now. Now it, you can fight the planer and everything on the whole rig. Now there are breakaways also that you can use, uh, but this is just a quick, easy, and there's different size planers for different size speeds. And, and I'll give you the credit. You look at all the fancy lures and all that, but still you go back to that old spoon, the old standby. That thing still forever. crushes Kings, Wahoo, the whole bit. Yep. And on that note, we're going to take a commercial break. And I want to come back and talk about trolling swimming plugs for Wahoo as well as live baiting. So we'll be right back. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures, for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Back to discussing Wahoo. And I want to jump into plug trolling for Wahoo, but first I want to ask Alan, I'm looking at that lure, uh, which brings to light your best colors. And I, I noticed you have a lot of mylar and reflectivity right. in there. Well, we, we talked earlier about my kids doing a lot of spearfishing. I don't like that, to hear that, but yeah. go ahead. Well, well, they free dive, so they don't, <laughs> they don't scuba. But they get on there and they use a lot of flashers, a lot of mylar flashers. And that's when they actually watch the fish come in and they get attracted, not even so much by the, the bait, but by the flashers. So when you're getting a lure is you want to make sure that you have a lot of high visible mylar type reflective material on there. So, you know, you can see even though it's, it's purple and black, but they're very well reflective material. Um, and then there's obviously the, 
the big silver ones, but that's really the key. Yeah. It's not so much the dark colors as it is the, the flashiness of it. Gotcha, very good. All right, one of the simplest ways and most effective to catch Wahoo, swimming plugs. And I learned this a number of, I hate to say, decades ago out of Louisiana with Captain Mike Furnett. We went Wahoo fishing. He put four CD-18s out and we crushed the Wahoo up to 68 pounds that day. Very simple, you get a, a, one of these plugs like the Rappler, the CD-18 is a standard, now they make them in the 30 and the 40, and you just position them behind the boat, you set them out, and you go trolling, and they're subsurface. Wahoo gravitate to two things. They like speed, and they like subsurface bait. So anything you have, even if it's only going two feet under the surface, and it's moving somewhat rapidly, you're gonna get more Wahoo strikes because of it. Now, real quickly on trolling these lures, for general trolling with plugs, if you're pulling five, six, seven knots or so, single strand wire would work, like 60 pound test, 70 pound test. You start cranking up to 10 uh, miles an hour in there, what happens, the action of the plug could actually kink the single strand. If you're looking to pull these at a higher clip, double single strand wire is your better bet. It would, would stand the rigors of trolling these plugs a lot better. Then you have cable, which is very good. It won't kink, but cable stands out a lot. But if you're chasing bigger fish in the Bahamas, that's a good choice. And the all-time best, though, is with a fluorocarbon leader or mono leader that could be 80 pound, 100, maybe 110 pound test. And these Wahoo, like kings, they strike generally right behind the head. So we've caught Wahoo out of Venice, Louisiana before, trolling by a buoy, we've taken six Wahoo on a setup like this with a Rapala. And on the seventh fish, he actually cut ahead and lost it. But trading out six Wahoo, for a plug, it's not a bad deal. Not a bad deal at all. Though. Jimmy, live baiting. Uh, people want to know more about live baiting. You have live baiting Wahoo down with science. Tell us about that. Uh, when I'm live baiting for Wahoo, George, uh, there's one thing that I find in Wahoo's stomach, and that's bonitas. And more, more often than not, when you find something in their stomach, it's a bonita. And uh, the rigs that I use, you know, I live bait, I live bait the bonitas, and uh, the rigs that I use is a triple hook rig like this. I got the, the treble hooks, uh, number two treble hooks spread out about three, three inches apart or so, so you can hook one in the lip, in the upper, in the upper lip, in the middle, and towards the tail. And, uh, and I, I troll the bonitas up. You have, really have to be prepared uh, for this. You have to have at least three of these set up, three rods set up, ready to go. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. Stay cool and protected while fishing. Calcutta Outdoors, hard-working outdoor gear. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West. Visit flakeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the final installment of the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. And, and what, what pound test wire, incidentally? That is... That wire right there is nine. I use number nine wire on the hooks, between yep. the hooks, and number seven wire up, okay. to, the, up to the swivel. Gotcha. Or now I'll write it on there. The hard part, catch a banana. And here's the hard part. <laughs> what I do <laughs> is I set, up, I set up little jigs like this on a chain. I set them up about five feet apart, and I'll do four or five of them connected with a little planer in the front. The smallest planer, number yep. one. You can pull this on a spinner, a light conventional, start dragging this around. You have the other rods set up with the treble hooks, and you have got them ready. And then when you hook, when, uh, when you hook the Benitas, it trips the planer, comes up, and hopefully you have four of them on there. Get them on there, get them out, put it in free spool, let them run out, and go to the next one. And then what do you do? You just sort of bump troll these around the wreck, get them in a neutral a little bit, move it in forward I, you progression? You keep the boat or? going the whole time. Because if you don't, if you pull the boat out of gear too long, that Benita, since he's wanting to go fast, he'll swim past the wire, and then a lot of times one of the treble hooks will catch on the wire, and then you're pulling the Benita backwards. So you always want to keep him moving forward at a pretty, pretty good rate, you know, a couple knots or so. So you keep him behind the boat, and that keeps him from getting tangled, too. If you slow down, those Benitas will start cutting one way or another, and then you got three Very good, effective up. way of fishing wrecks. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really effective. Harry, you're smirking. Look like you have something you want to follow up no, with. No, I just, it's a great, but <laughs> bottom line, you got to be prepared for this stuff. Yeah. If you're going to, if you're going to fish like this, and, and it's, which is deadly as, as can be, you got to be ready for it. You got to have the whole Absolutely. setup, the planer. You got to have the baits, the rigs. I mean, it's, and any fishing, you got to be ready. You got to be rigged. Don't start rigging while you're out there. We're coming in like the last minute here, and I just want to make these key points. Alan Wenzel, 
talked about the tide change being important. Right. That salooner periods, the moon up, moon down, moon rise, moon set, those are really good feeding periods which correlate with the change in the tides triggers bites of a lot of fish, including wahoo. Uh, also, as you mentioned too, very early in the morning, that very first light bite is always a natural feeding cycle as well as the last one when that sun is dropping down. But with wahoo, the other things that come into play, you get a southwest wind right before a front they go on a big tear. And I know it's dangerous to sit there and in, in, you're off South Florida, you're close, but when you're farther offshore trying to time that, but Wahoo go on a tear when that wind goes Southwest, right before that front starts moving in that evening or the next day, it's a major feeding cycle where it really gets going good. And again, the other things, speed and depth, but working a small boats, like we're talking about here in live baiting, is an effective way to catch Wahoo. And guys like Jimmy Gagler, Denny, Harry, Vernon, Alan Winsel, Prove it time in and time again. I appreciate that session on Wahoo. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We're coming back with yet another exciting panel. Well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Now, adhering to Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series tradition, you still have chances to win door price drawings. Simply go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door price page, just give us your name, phone number, and an email address, and at the conclusion of the airing of the series in December, we will draw for a number of excellent door prizes. Get right to it. We'll see you on the next episode of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series.